We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations. This blemished chapter in our national history. For those who don't know, this is former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. On the 13th of February 2008, he apologised on behalf of the entire nation for the stolen generations, an alleged atrocity describing a so-called policy to remove Aboriginal children from their families in order to assimilate them into white culture. For years, his predecessor John Howard was pressured into saying sorry, but he consistently refused. Then, when Kevin Rudd took office, he wasted little time before signalling his virtue. He was oh so sorry for such a horribly racist policy, you see. There's just one problem. This so-called stolen generation never actually happened. On December 20th, 2013, West Australian Supreme Court Justice Janine Pritchard rejected 20 claims there was an official WA program to remove children from their homes due to their aboriginality. She found all removals took place in order to protect them from physical harm and abuse. This fit the pattern of other court cases. Every time an individual sues the state for allegedly being stolen, they lose. In the rare cases they win, it actually proves there was no policy to remove children for their race. The courts awarded Bruce Trevorrow $525,000 in a lawsuit regarding his own removal from his family. The media touted it as a landmark test case for the stolen generation. The only problem was, it proved the opposite. Trevorrow was removed illegally, and that's what the court found. This remains the only successful stolen generation case in history. To this date, there is still no evidence at all of any official policy to remove children from their families due to their aboriginality. Children were taken from their families, yes, but not because they were aboriginal. The state took them because of neglect and abuse, both physical and sexual. The state saved them from a life of squalor and despair. This is one of the only legitimate roles of government, according to esteemed economist Milton Friedman. In 2010, Keith Winshuttle wrote a two-part article for Quadrant regarding the so-called stolen generations. In this, he states, The idea that the removal policies had a racist component and were aimed at ending Aboriginality did not originate in Aboriginal testimony. Indeed, until the term stolen generations first appeared in 1981, there had been no popular tradition among Aboriginal people that employed either the term or the concept. In the 1910s and 20s, parents on some state-funded Aboriginal stations in New South Wales and South Australia did disagree with the government finding employment for their teenage children as four-year indentured apprentices. But these complaints were not about the removal of babies or young children. Moreover, these parents knew their children would be gone for a fixed term and then return. The person who initiated the idea that government wanted to destroy Aboriginality was a then-unknown white postgraduate history student, Peter Reed. He alone was granted the vision denied to all who came before him. In the course of just one day, he wrote a 20-page pamphlet to make his case. The original title was The Lost Generations, but his wife advised him to substitute the more attention-getting adjective, STOLEN. So the term stolen generations wasn't even coined by Aborigines. A white Australian history student made it up in 1981 in order to sensationalise the unproved idea that the Australian government removed children based on race. All for the nefarious goal of breeding out their Aboriginality. In his pamphlet, Reed discusses a so-called typical situation. Suppose that in 1950 a family containing seven children was living on a reserve when it was learned that an inspector of the Aborigines Protection Board was to pay a visit. 
Both the children and parents knew from past experience that they might have to fight for their right to stay together. What they did not know was that their names were already on the inspector's blacklist. As a family whose lifestyle did not match the manager's opinion of how Aboriginal families ought to live, nor did they know that a magistrate's committal hearing was scheduled for the following week, nor that the local police had already been asked to prepare a charge sheet for each of the children as neglected and under incompetent guardianship. Nor did they know that far away in Kutamundra and Kempsey, the superintendents had been warned to prepare places for several more children. A week later, the hearing was over. The children were committed but not allowed to return home. They were kept in the local hospital until on the eighth day after the hearing, they were quietly placed on a bus and driven away. No one waved goodbye. No one on the station even knew when they went. It all sounds so underhanded and evil, doesn't it? That's before you read this part. The family is imaginary. But every one of the details happened to one or more individuals. Yet the policy which allowed such events to take place was proposed, debated and affirmed in the Parliament of the State of New South Wales and for 50 years was sanctioned and administered by the Aborigines Protection Board. So the example was entirely fabricated, but you can trust him that it was common because reasons. What he doesn't do in his pamphlet is provide evidence of any policy to remove children based on their race. In fact, he does the exact opposite. Under the legislation of 1909, children could be removed without their parents' consent if only they were found by a magistrate to be neglected. Then in 1915, the board's efforts were rewarded with an amendment to the Act in 1915 which stated that any Aboriginal children might be removed without parental consent if the board considered it to be in the interest of the child's moral and physical welfare. And eventually, the law remained as it was until 1939 when Aboriginal children were again brought under the jurisdiction of a new Child Welfare Act. Magistrates' hearings before committal again became necessary, but a new category appeared in that act under which children could be removed from their families. In addition to being neglected, children could also be found to be uncontrollable. An Aboriginal child who refused to go to school, for instance, could be considered uncontrollable, and in fact, as many children were removed under the new legislation as had been under the Aborigines Protection Act. So the very source of the term stolen generations effectively admits there was no formal policy to remove children due to their race. In fact, it flat out states removals were for either the protection of the children or to ensure they go to school. Every single child in the nation is required to go to school until at least 15 years of age in most states. This has nothing to do with race and everything to do with broad government education policies. You can agree with compulsory schooling, but that doesn't make it a racist policy. Unless you think Aboriginals shouldn't go to school or something, which is a little bit racist, don't you think? The fact this myth pervades Australian culture is bad enough, but worse, it causes a reluctance to save Aboriginal children from abuse today. Australians are somehow guilty of crimes not committed while authorities leave innocent kids in abusive homes for fear of causing another so-called stolen generation. Recently in Tennant Creek, in the Northern Territory, a two-year-old girl was hospitalised and a man charged after she was sexually assaulted. Jeremy Summit discusses this incident in The Australian. This appalling tragedy happened despite repeated and well-founded warnings about the toddler's safety and proven findings that she had suffered abuse and neglect. This was no case of workers being ignorant of the situation. The girl allegedly suffered unimaginable sexual abuse in plain sight of the government agency meant to protect her. This is a shocking indictment of how the ideology within child protection authorities that favours family preservation at almost all costs stops children from being rescued and exposes them to prolonged abuse and neglect, sometimes, as in this case, with catastrophic results. Doesn't this sound a hell of a lot like certain grooming gangs in England motivated by the ideology that shall not be named? Authorities here likely knew about what was going on, but did nothing for fear of seeming racist or causing another so-called stolen generation. Despite the agency having received 
21 notifications that the girl was in danger almost from the time of birth and despite some of these warnings of harm having been proved to have occurred, Territory Families has defended its failure to intervene on the basis that the agency was doing its best to keep the family intact. Authorities were warned repeatedly what was going on, but they did nothing because they wanted to keep the f***ing family together. Well, I guess that makes it okay then. I mean, they just wanted to keep them all cosy as a family unit while the child was being abused and raped. I'm so glad they had all the best intentions. That makes it so much better. Good God. Here are a few more examples from a 2013 Andrew Bolt column. In 2006, when social workers removed an Aboriginal girl from her loving but white foster family, saying the family was repeating the stolen generations, the girl, who'd been pack raped at seven, was returned to her community at Arukan and was pack raped again. In 2007, welfare officers found a 12-year-old girl crying on the floor of her Darwin home, but were told by her part Aboriginal foster carers that she was scared she'd be taken away. So they left her. She died the next day in the dirt outside with a litre and a half of pus in her legs, covered with ants and hallucinating about fairies in the trees. In 2003, five-month-old Mundine Orchard died in Brewerina after what the coroner called a systematic attack while in the care of relatives. And a day after, a Department of Community Services officer dropped off a fridge and washing machine. A DOCS report had advised that the Indigenous community needs to be treated, in child protection terms, with constant sensitivity to the historical impact of the stolen generations. These examples are not isolated. They fit a pattern. Authorities care more about seeming good than saving children. That's just the truth. There was no stolen generation. There was never any policy to remove children based on the colour of their skin. There was a policy to save children from abusive households and give them a chance at life, but it had nothing to do with skin colour. Not only is this myth an attack on the good actions of good people, and an attack on Western liberal and Christian values, it's an attack on innocent children. It's a myth that condemns kids to live a life of misery, all so the sanctimonious left can feel better about themselves. These same leftists then blame white Europeans and Western culture for all the problems in Aboriginal communities. It's an insidious lie that condemns children to hell then blames the innocent all while ignoring the issue of Aboriginal welfare dependence that fuels alcohol and drug use resulting in massive amounts of domestic violence and child abuse. It's time to stick up for innocent Aboriginal kids and save them from hell. It's time to end the myth of the stolen generation. You hear that? Betty said a bad word! I know, he must be really pissed off. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for watching the video. Don't forget to share it around if you're going to do it. Don't worry about triggering leftists, I'm sure you will. But that's their problem, not yours. If you share it, it really helps me out because YouTube are really unlikely to recommend my video uh, to anyone else. So if you leave a like as well, comment, let me know what you thought of it. And uh, I'll see you when I see ya.